If you're interested in more about the center, please visit our website. Uh, in the center, we do have uh, 24 faculty and principal investigators working on subsurface energy problems. Within the center, we do a number of subsurface applications, including oil and gas, as well as other uh, energy and environmental issues in the subsurface. We bring together a lot of different technical disciplines as well as engineering tools. We collaborate with industry in a lot of different ways. A few of those are our industrial affiliates projects, which many of you may be familiar with. I would like to bring to your attention that attention that we are putting together a new industrial affiliates project, which we call Carbon UT or Carbon Utilization Storage and Transportation, and it focuses on um, storage and utilization um, as well as transportation of uh, carbon dioxide. Uh, we're bringing together a number of principal investigators with a lot of different expertise and backgrounds. You can see that here on the right and our um, scope and objectives are listed on the left. Uh, if you're interested, you can contact me or, or, or Tracy in the center or you can directly contact Dr. Espinoza or today's speaker, Dr. Akunu, who are the technical leaders of this new project. These monthly webinars are informative, industry-driven webinars by researchers and collaborators in the center. Generally, they occur the first Friday of the month at noon via Teams. However, all webinars are loaded on YouTube if you can't make it live but want to watch it after the fact. Our upcoming webinar next month on June 4th is going to be Dr. Uh, Risuki Okunu, um, and he's going to talk about novel wettability modifiers to improve oil recovery from tidal shales. And then the following month in July, we're planning a, planning a panel discussion on carbon utilization storage and transportation that uh, is related to the industrial affiliates project I mentioned. So with that, I would like to introduce to today's speaker, Dr. Hugh, Daigle is an associate professor in the Hildebrand Department of Petroleum Geosystems Engineering, as well as in the Center for Subsurface Energy and the Environment. He holds a BA degree in Earth and Planetary Sciences from Harvard University and a PhD in Earth Science from Rice University. His industry experience includes work as a wireline field engineer at Schlumberger, as well as a petrophysicist at Schlumberger, Brigham, Brigham Oil and, Ga and Gas in Chevron. His research interests include fluid flow and porous media, geohazards, gas hydrate, and nanotechnology in the upstream and oil and gas industry. He is a co-author of the recent book, Practical Nanotechnology for Petroleum Engineers. And I think today he's gonna talk to us a little bit about nanotechnology. So thanks a lot, Hugh, and I'll turn it over. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Matt, for the introduction. Um, and thank you all for uh, for coming to the webinar today. So as Matt said, I'm going to be talking about some nanotechnology applications in the upstream oil and gas industry. So just to start out with, I want to get down to a good definition of what nanotechnology is, um, because this is a word we hear a lot. And being engineers, we like to have good definitions of what things are. So nanotechnology is any technological application that uses nanoparticles either individually or as assemblages or composites. And I'll talk about what a nanoparticle is in a little bit. But what this allows us to do is create new and improved materials with uh, superior properties and, and functionalities that we don't get from conventional materials. Um, these include really cool things like nano sensors and nano catalysts. Um, motors and batteries and power sources, which I think are very exciting. Here's an image here on the right from a paper by Yang et al. This is a nano battery that generates electricity by applying a temperature difference across it. And it's made up of these, um, these zinc oxide and the uh, Indian tin oxide um, uh, substrate. So really interesting stuff. These things can be very small. And what I'm going to talk a little bit about today is that <coughs> Excuse me, we can use nanotechnology as replacements or enhancers for chemicals and chemical processes. And this opens up a lot of possibility, both in terms of improving sustainability of upstream oil and gas and giving us some new capabilities that we might not have had before. 
Now, here in my research group at UT in in uh, in PGE and in uh, in the Center for Subsurface Energy and the Environment, we found a lot of interesting stuff with nanotechnology. Um, here's a partial list of some of the things we've done. Everything from improving formation evaluation by investigating uh, nuclear magnetic resonance contrast agents. Um, we have some work um, on carbon sequestration, which um, Matt alluded to with his plug for the new industrial affiliates program. Um, we've done work on water decontamination, so removing heavy metals and oil droplets from produced water, um, wettability alteration, uh, pickering emulsion stabilization and foam stabilization. We've worked with nano paint that generates heat, and uh, we've worked done work on wellbore stability, which I'll talk about today. So there's a very broad range of areas where nanotechnology is applicable in upstream oil and gas operations, and this is just focusing on upstream. There's a lot potential of potential in midstream and downstream as well that uh, we haven't even gotten into. And just a plug for some of the work that we've done. Matt mentioned this book. Here's our, our book that came out in 2019, but um, we've had 21 additional papers just in the past five years on various nanoparticle applications. Um, I'm very fortunate to be here in the center where we have a very collaborative atmosphere and a lot of good people to work with. So, you know, everything um, from, you know, SPE papers to papers in, you know, Journal of Colloid and Interface Science on a variety of topics. Okay, so let's define what nanoparticles are. So a nanoparticle, we're going to say that it's a solid particle with at least one dimension smaller than 100 nanometers. So it doesn't have to be a sphere. It can be anything from, you know, what we might think as a particle, which is a sphere or a spherically shaped little particle, but it can also be carbon nanotubes, um, nanosheets. This is a graphene nanosheet or nano rods. So they can have all kinds of different morphologies. The key is that one of those dimensions has to be smaller than 100 nanometers. And these nanoparticles can be made out of anything from metal oxides, which we work a lot with, to carbon. You know, a lot of work has been done with single wall carbon nanotubes. My alma mater over at Rice is, is quite famous for that. Um, they can be made of polymers. Um, a lot of good work uh, using you know, polystyrene and latex and other types of polymer nanoparticles. But the key is they have to be small. Now, what's so great about them? Well, it is the fact that they are small. So because the nanoparticles are small, they have a very large surface area relative to their mass, and that means that they have surface-free energy. And you can think of that as additional energy that can be exploited to improve whatever you're doing. So if I defer, define a specific surface area, which is just a surface area to mass ratio, if you think about a sphere, the, that ratio, if you do the math, here's the surface area of a sphere and here's the mass of that sphere where rho is the density. It's going to be equal to three over the diameter times the density. So if you think about two different particles, here's a silica particle with a radius of 100 microns. So you could think of this as, you know, a sand, a particle of a, a grain of sand. Um, that silica particle has a specific surface area of about 10 square meters per kilogram of those particles. So if you take a kilogram of those particles, you've got about as much surface area in there as you have in half of a one car garage. OK, so pretty impressive. But now if we decrease the size of that particle by a factor of a thousand, so same material, but now the radius is 100 nanometers. So this is a nanoparticle. The surface area contained in one kilogram of those particles is 10,000 square meters. And so that's almost two football fields, right? A football field is about 5,400 square meters. So a huge amount of surface area that you can do all kinds of interesting stuff with. So what I want you to take away from this webinar today is that it is interactions at the nanoscale that give nanoparticles their power. Now, there are three main interactions that I'll talk about today in, in our applications. So the first is van der Waals forces. These are attractive forces between two smarticles that arise from instantaneous dipole generation and London dispersion forces. So, you know, we've learned about this in probably in high school chemistry. There's electrostatic interactions. So this is the same thing that allows you to stick um, a balloon to your hair. This gentleman looks very thrilled about that. And then there's steric interactions, which happen when you have particles that are coated with polymer 
and try to get close to each other. These steric forces will actually repel them because it's related to trying to squeeze the water out from between those particles. There are other forces of lesser importance that we're not going to touch on today, but these are the main three that I want you to keep in the back of your mind. And how do we control these interaction forces? Well, it's really all about the surface chemistry. So I'm going to keep coming back to surface area and surface chemistry. Um, we do a lot of our work with silica nanoparticles, and there's really two ways you can modify the surface chemistry. One is by just simply heat treating the particles, and um, fumed silica is what you see a lot of the time where these particles are heat treated and actually changes the surface chemistry from um, being pretty hydrophilic, where a lot of the surface uh, is covered with silanol groups, to being fairly hydrophobic when you heat it up to over 1,000 degrees Celsius, you destroy all the silanols and turn them into siloxanes. And so you can alter the wettability, you can alter the surface charge just by heat treating your silica. Uh, the other way that you can change the surface chemistry is by putting things on the surface. And so we do a lot of work where we'll take a silica particle and add some kind of a polymer, polymer with a silane group at the end. And we actually graft it onto the surface. There's a couple of different surface reactions that we can use for this. And it gives us this particle that's got these polymers um, sticking off of it, which you can either attach things onto the polymer to get it to do things, or you can simply use those polymers to increase the steric repulsion between the particles. So a lot of interesting things you can do here. Now the three keys to a successful application of nanotechnology are, Number one, controlling the interaction forces between the particles. This is very important. The second thing is by exploiting the large surface area that these particles have. And last but most importantly is understanding the fundamental mechanisms of what's going on. And so just to hammer this home, this is from the last chapter of our nanotechnology book. And you know, just to summarize what this quote says, a lot of the time you'll see people say, oh, this you know, fancy nanotechnology. You're going to add, sprinkle your nanoparticles in there, add a little fairy dust. And, um, you know, there's a lot of misconceptions out there about how nanotechnology works. And I really want to um, show you here how it works and help demystify some of these processes so that we can, we can better understand it. Okay, so let's talk about some applications. I'm going to start out by talking about um, an application that we, we investigated in drilling fluids. Um, there's a couple of SPE um, conference papers and a paper in SPE drilling and completion associated with this. And I was fortunate enough to work with my colleague here, Dr. Eric Van Oort, on this project. So the problem that we investigated is reducing the rate of fluid infiltration when you're drilling a well through a shale sequence. So the problem that you run into when you drill through any formation, but particularly through shale, is that if you're drilling overbalanced, the fluid in the borehole is going to try to leak into the formation. And what that's going to do is it's going to decrease the effective stress in the near well bore region because you're increasing the pore pressure. And over time, if you think about this in a more Coulomb sense, so here's your more circle prior to drilling fluid infiltration. As the drilling fluid infiltrates and reduces the effective stress, that whole Mohr circle will move to the left and it can eventually intersect your shear failure envelope. And this um, causes uh, borehole collapse. And so this is really bad. And so if we can prevent this from happening and allow you to have that open hole for a longer amount of time, you can have safer operations and get more done before you eventually run casing and seal off that interval. So we did some laboratory tests to investigate how well uh, drilling fluids amended with nanoparticles could uh, prevent fluid infiltration and help um, keep the well bore strong where we've drilled through it. So we did a couple of different types of tests. Um, one of them is a pressure transmission test. So basically you take a sample of rock and you confine it radially and you apply a pressure differential across it and you see how long it takes the pressure that you've applied upstream to propagate to the downstream end of the sample. Um, and that's pretty much all there is fluid, through, all there is to it, excuse me. Um, the other thing we did is these thick walled cylinder tests. So this is where you take a sample of rock, which is a cylinder, and you drill a hole through it. So it's like a miniature borehole. And you apply a confining stress, and then you apply pressure inside the little hole you drilled through. 
and you gradually increase the confining pressure and see where it fails. OK, so that's going to be your thick walled cylinder collapse pressure. This is just a, a, a stress versus strain plot here showing what we do. You increase the stress. You have a lot of volume strain at failure. Um, and we do this after circulating overbalanced drilling fluid through the sample for 12 to 24 hours. OK, so we did this with some Mancos shale. So Mancos shale is a clay rich shale from the um, you know, Rocky Mountain Basin in, in North America. And what we did with was we measured the thick wall cylinder collapse pressure after circulating with different types of drilling fluids with different types of nano silica in them. And we compared them to what we're calling this pressure transmission um, test delay factor. And what that is, is it's looking relative to some reference they've done. So if you measure the the pressure in the sample, you can think of this term here. It's really just a proxy for how how much the pressure difference is across the sample. If you measure how much that changes over time, um, if you're doing a better job controlling the fluid infiltration into the rock, it'll take longer for the pressure to propagate across the sample. And so you can take these different tests and fit lines to the data. And the difference in the slope of those lines, we call that, or the ratio of the slope in that lines, we call that the pressure transmission test delay factor. So a longer delay factor is better. And what you can see is that for the different types of nanoparticles that we tested, there is a relationship between the pressure transmission test delay factor and the thick wall cylinder collapse pressure. Longer delay factors are correlated with higher collapse pressure, so the, the rock is stronger. Um, just for reference, this dashed line here, this is the um, confined compressive strength, or no, excuse me, the unconfined compressive strength of Mancos shale. So you can see that you know, some of these particles are approaching that, which is, which is very good. So the question is, what's going on here? Well, it's actually, we think, mainly different, driven by electrostatic interactions between the nanoparticles and the shale surface. So your silica nanoparticle generally is going to have a negative surface charge. In aqueous solution at moderate pH, silica has a negative surface charge. We, we know that. Now, shale is variable, you know, depending on how much clay and silica versus how much carbonate material you have in the shale, it can have a positive or a negative surface charge. And so, you know, depending on what the strength of that interaction is between the nanoparticle and the shale, you can either have repulsion or attraction. So what we did was we measured the zeta potential of our shale sample and our nanoparticles at the conditions at which we tested them. So we've got five different types of um, nanoparticles here that we used uh, in our drilling fluids. We've got uh, a negatively charged you know, uncoated nanoparticle. We have what we're calling, it's nominally a cationic um, nanoparticle, but actually it turns out it has a negative surface charge. Um, and then we have a couple of other surface coated nanoparticles that we tested at different pH. So there's a lot going on in this plot, but the, um, the bar here shows you the pH of the drilling fluid. Um, the blue line shows you the zeta potential of the nanoparticle, and that axis is over here on the right, and then the black line shows you the zeta potential of the shale. So a couple of things that you want to note here is that the shale always has a closer to neutral zeta potential than the nanoparticles, okay? It's not always positive, but it's much closer to positive or much closer to zero than any of the nanoparticles are. The other thing is that I want to point out this bare quote unquote cationic nanoparticle. Now I say quote unquote because it actually turns out it had a negative zeta potential at the conditions we tested at, but at that particular pH, our shale sample had a positive zeta potential and the nanoparticle had a negative zeta potential. So there's actually electrostatic attraction going on there. Now we can get into this a little bit further by plotting the, um, uh, the potential between the particle and the shale as a function of separation distance at different um, at different uh, 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 conditions. So again, what we're looking at here is we're looking at the um, van der Waals forces, which are going to be the uh, red line here, and then the electrostatic forces. So th those are the only two forces we're considering. You add them together and that gets you the total interaction potential, which is this green line, and negative is attractive and positive is repulsive. 
So you can see for this one that we're plotting here, everything is negative. And so this particular particle would be attracted um, to the uh, to the shale surface. Now, when we plug in the appropriate values from our nanoparticles and our shale, um, we see that for that um, bare nanosilica that we tested, that we the, the nominally cationic one, the interaction potential is always attractive. So it's always going to be attracted to the surface of that shale. That's not true for all of the other ones. So for the modified nanosilica at pH of 8.7, you can see there's this hump here. It's a potential energy barrier that you have to overcome before the particle will be attracted to the shale surface. And our negatively charged bare nanosilica has an even larger potential barrier. So what's going on here, we think, is that the that particular nanosilica with the green line, it's best attracted to the shale surface. And so what that allows you to do is you get that nanoparticle to the shale surface and it plugs up those very, very small pores in the shale and greatly reduces the rate of fluid infiltration. And so you can look at how these, uh, these potential curves compare to the results of our experiments. So the red line is this point down here. So it's kind of the middle of the pack. But as we step up, in terms of pressure transmission delay factor and, and collapse pressure, you can see that as the hump there, the height of that energy barrier decreases, you move up that line. And in fact, the best results we got were for the nanoparticle with no potential energy barrier. So we can clearly see that there's a relationship here between the results and the amount of attraction we have between the nanoparticles and the shale surface. So this is really interesting. I think it shows how you can design your nanoparticles and amend them into your drilling fluid to uh, really improve the performance. And the takeaway from this application is that controlling the nanoparticle surface charge is uh, really the key, the key to, the, uh, to the success of your application. Now, I just want to take a moment here to pause and uh, re remind you that if you want to ask a question, um, please do so in the Q&A feature. I'll have a look at that after we get to the end of the presentation. Um, there's a little bit of a delay between what I'm saying and when you hear it. And so if you can just type your questions in there, we'll address those when we get to the end of the presentation. Thank you. Okay, now, now that we've learned about some applications in drilling fluids, I want to briefly talk about some applications in um, cement, which uh, are pre is pretty interesting. Okay, so there are a lot of studies out there in the literature now that show that if you add nanoparticles to cement, it improves the properties of the cement. Okay, well, what do I mean by improve? So here's a nice paper by um, Pang et al, where they looked at the um, strength and uh, curing properties of class H cement that has had various types of nanoparticles um, added to it. So we've got calcium chloride and then a bunch of different silica nanoparticles. So this here on the left shows you we've got heat flow versus time and then the total heat flow evolution versus time. So um, cement hydration is an uh, exothermic process. And so the amount of heat that's generated is uh, taken as a proxy for the amount for the rate of hydration and the amount of strength that you develop. So um, what's really interesting is that if you look at the uh, the amount of heat flow at a given time, you can see that the uh, calcium chloride here gives you a lot of early heat flow. But if you look here on the right, this is the cumulative heat flow. So if you integrate that heat flow over time, what you can see is that after that early peak, the calcium chloride kind of trails off. And it's these nanosilica additives that really give you the most cumulative heat flow. Um, and it's much larger than in the case where you have no additives. So this is interesting. The other thing that's interesting is that you get um, some really good early strength development. So what's going on here, this is uh, the different additives that were, add, that were put into the Class H cement. And we've got the compressive strength here measured um, after 48 hours in blue, seven days in red, and 28 days in green. And you can see, especially for the, uh, the seven day compressive strength, the cements that have had nanosilica added to them are greatly above what you get where you've just got neat cement or um, the calcium chloride added to it. So silica gives you more heat flow generation. It gives you more early strength development. Um, 
and this is uh, can be quite uh, quite important for for downhole operations. So the question is, why does it do this? Well, this is a, mainly a surface area issue. So remember again that nanosilica has an extremely high surface area, and this works to your advantage in the process of cement hydration. So here's a um, an explanation here on the left. So you can think of your um, your cement in a general sense as being this um, this um, cement particle here. This is either your C2S or your C3S particle, and it's surrounded by water. Um, and in the process of hydration at the molecular scale, you partially dissolve some of the um, some of the silicates out of the cement, and um, and some of the the calcium, and the water goes into that cement phase. And what happens over time is you generate that um, CSH um, gel structure, which is what gives the cement its strength. And um, these um, you know, are initially these nano-sized CSH particles. And over time, those will grow and form an interconnected network and give you that strength development. Now, there's a difference between what happens when you have um, neat cement versus when you've added nanosilica. And it really has to do with the fact that the nanosilica acts as a seeding point for the CSH development. So um, when you don't have nanosilica, what happens is you know, your CHH, CSH gel is what's going to be formed in this red around your particle. And over time, it's going to grow from the cement particle out. And so you're going to have a lot of intervening space between those particles that you have to fill up with CSH before you form an interconnected load bearing network that gives you strength. OK, now. If your fluid between your cement particles has a source of silica in the form of silica nanoparticles, you can start forming the CSH around those particles too because of transport through the aqueous phase. And after a given amount of time, you'll have a much better interconnected network of CSH gel than you have in the case where you just have neat cement. So that's the general idea. So if you can add those seeding points, which you know nanosilica works great for that because they have a, a huge surface area, then you can get that early strength development and everybody's happy. Now the problem here, it gets back again to interparticle potentials and interparticle interactions. Um, the aqueous phase during cement curing has an extremely high ionic strength. The pH can be over 11. Uh, you have a lot of calcium dissolved in the water, so a lot of divalent cations. And what happens is that it really reduces the amount of electrostatic repulsion you would have between your silica nanoparticles. So here's one of these potential plots here. I've got the van der Waals um, attractive force down here, and here's the electrostatic repulsive force. And what happens is as you increase the ionic strength, the degree of electrostatic repulsion goes down. And if you add these two things together, your total potential will eventually get to the point where if you increase the ionic strength enough, this potential barrier disappears. And just like we saw in the case of wellbore stability where it was good, in this case it's not going to be good because if your ionic strength is too high, your silica particles will aggregate and then you lose all the, um, the nice effects of having the high surface area. So here's uh, an example of what happens when your nanosilica aggregates. OK, so um, this is a mini cone test on a cement paste that's um, had one and a half weight percent nano bare nanosilica added to it. Um, what's really interesting is it's a little bit counterintuitive here, but the nanosilica actually made the cement less pumpable. So you know, normally you'd expect that the cement will be able to flow, right? Which is good because you need to pump it down hole. But in this case, the, the, the silica nanoparticles aggregated and they actually got in the way of the cement grains moving past each other. And this thing just sat there and would not flow under its own its own weight. So, you know, obviously this can be good or it can be bad. For oil field cement, this would be a big problem because it's not pumpable. Um, but this was a really an interesting paper by this um, uh, by a group out of France where they actually said this could really be good for 3D printing because you can think of 3D printing a structure where you don't want it to flow before the cement has cured. So maybe this is good. It's not good for our purposes though. You, it actually turns out you just want that little bit of aggregation, not too much and not too little. So 
if you have a little bit of aggregation, so these individual particles form these small aggregates, that's actually good because they can um, situate themselves in the nooks and crannies between the cement particles and provide a lot of capillary porosity, which contains a lot of water in there, a lot of available surface area for reactions. That's good. As the uh, aggregate gets larger, it actually is going to force apart the cement grains. And so it'll be harder for the cement to build strength because the grains are farther apart. And if, this, if the aggregate gets way too big, actually it's going to soak up a lot of the water and it's not going to be available for, chem for uh, chemical reactions. And so you greatly increase the paste viscosity in that case. Like I said, sometimes that, that's good, but for oil field cement, that's bad. And so you really want to be at the sweet spot over here. And so there's a real opportunity here that I know several groups out in industry are, are working on. I think um, you know, um, uh, Saudi Aramco is definitely working on these sorts of problems um, where you want to balance the surface charges and the surface interactions between the nanosilica to get just that right amount of aggregation. Um, and it has to work at very high ionic strength. So there's definitely some things you could try to do this. Um, you know, I talked about, you know, polymer coatings or heat treating your silica. So, um, you know, definitely some things that can that can be tried. But there's a significant opportunity here that I think deserves further research. OK, the last bit that I'm going to talk about here is um, some of the applications that we've done in emulsions and foams, um, stabilizing emulsions and foams with nanoparticles. Um, we have, um, let's see, uh, a whole bunch of papers on this. This is one of the areas where we've been most active over the past few years. Um, we have a couple of um, ATCE um, manuscripts on this, one that's going to be presented this fall that uh, my student Daniel Hatchell is is working on also a bunch of papers in um, in JCIS that you can you can look up if you're interested. But speaking of finding just the right amount of aggregation, we'll see why we'll see where that comes into play here with emulsion stabilization. Okay, so we work with what are called Pickering emulsions. These are emulsions where the droplets of the emulsion are stabilized by having solid particles adhere to them. So here's an example of an oil and water emulsion. Here's our oil droplet. It's got solid particles around it and it's dispersed in this continuous phase, which is which is water. So you could contrast this with a surfactant stabilized emulsion where you've got surfactants at the interface instead. Um, there's plenty of work being done on those by other people in this department. Um, we work with Pickering emulsions. Now what's neat about Pickering emulsions, there's a lot of neat things about them, but one of them is that Depending on the wettability of the particle you use to stabilize them, you can generate either a water and oil emulsion or an oil and water emulsion. And it really just depends on what the orientation of the contact line is on the surface of your particle. So the, uh, the particle will prefer to be dispersed in the phase that wets it, obviously. And so the wetting phase will form the continuous phase of your emulsion. So a hydro hydrophilic particle will make an oil and water emulsion and hydrophobic will make water and oil emulsion. Now there's also some interesting things you can do um, with foams that differ a little bit from this Pickering emulsion um, scheme. You, um, you can actually um, prevent the drainage of the lamellae in the foam by using these particles to either bridge the interface or jam the interface, depending on how um, depending on how big they are relative to the to the thickness of that of that foam. And again, this all comes down to controlling the uh, the wettability of the particles and which fluid phase they prefer to be situated in. OK, so we work a lot with understanding the stability of the, the emulsions. So if you are going to use an emulsion for something like um, enhanced oil recovery or conformance control, you want that emulsion not to break down as soon as you inject it into the formation. You know, what's what's the point of doing that? So we need these things to remain stable during flow through porous media. Now, the general idea is that if you have an emulsion droplet, just conceptually, if you think about it, the more particles you have on that surface, the stronger you, ex you expect that interface to be, right? Because um, there's less interfacial area of fluid-fluid contact available to, um, to break in that case. So generally, higher surface coverage on your droplets will uh, 
produce more stable emulsion. The other thing that's interesting is that um, more stable emulsions tend to have smaller droplets. So um, here are some uh, microscope images of emulsion droplets. These are stable emulsions after 14 days. You can see very little change in the uh, size distribution of the droplets. This is an unstable emulsion. Over time, the droplets coarsen, they get bigger, and it's a weak emulsion. So we want the droplets to be small and not to coalesce over time. That's what we define as a stable emulsion. So really, to get a stable emulsion, you need to find the right particle wettability, the right particle size, the right droplet size, the right number of particles on the droplet surface, and on and on and on and on, okay? There's a lot going on here. And so what we focused on is breaking this down and understanding what the effects of these different properties are on emulsion stabilization, okay? So let's start out with the assumption that the strongest, most stable emulsions are going to be generated when you're able to pack as many particles onto the surface of the droplet as possible, okay? So this emulsion is okay. We've got a bunch of droplets on there. This one's going to be stronger, and this is going to be your strongest emulsion because you've packed as many particles onto that droplet surface as you possibly can. Okay, now, as you might expect, I'm going to come back to particle-particle interaction forces. What if your nanoparticles don't want to get that close to each other? You might be stuck here when you want to be here. Is this a problem? Well, we've been looking at that. And to start out with, I want to tell you how we quantify the stability of an emulsion. So we don't just make the emulsion and let it sit on the bench top for a month. Um, we've done that, you know, that type of test goes back 15, 20 years, and um, we you know, have more sophisticated ways of doing that. What we actually do is we centrifuge the emulsion. So we form the emulsion, we put it in a centrifuge vial, and then uh, we spin it uh, for 15 minutes at an acceleration of 5,000 times gravity. Um, then what we do is we look to see how much um, oil is released from the emulsion. So we're working with oil and water emulsions. We're using decane as the oil phase. And so um, we can measure how much of the decane comes out. And the um, idea is that a, an emulsion that's more stable will release less oil um, under centrifugation. So here's a couple of images of some emulsions that we've tested. These ones here on the left, you can see there's water down here at the bottom. There's decane up here at the top. There's a little bit of emulsion left over in the middle, but these are very unstable emulsions. This is a nice stable emulsion. So we've got some water at the bottom, a little bit of decane that came out, but most of the emulsion has remained um, intact here. The reason we get water coming out at the bottom is because the emulsion actually creams during the centrifugation, but the droplets have not broken. Uh, so that's good. Okay, so. My student Daniel has run a ton of these tests. He's very good at them. And um, what we're looking at here, these are decane in water emulsions that are stabilized with silica nanoparticles that we have coated with a, um, an organic ligand, uh, which we call glymo. It's this, uh, this long name here. Um, and it's coated, they're, they're, the, the particles are coated with a 33% surface coverage. So it means that 33% of the, of the available surface sites are, are covered with, with glymo. And um, what you can see is that there's a definite trend. We've tested these both with um, deionized water as the aqueous phase and also with a uh, brine as the aqueous phase. And you can see generally, as you increase the amount of nanoparticles that you have, um, in the in the emulsion, you release less oil during centrifugation. So, um, you know, ideally for a perfectly stable emulsion, you won't release any oil, and your plot your points will plot along the um, the bottom line here. Okay. Now, um, one thing I want to point out is that you'll notice that in when you're using brine, it takes fewer nanoparticles to make a stable emulsion. Now we'll come back to that in a minute. Okay, but let's think about what the surface coverage on the droplets are with respect to nanoparticles, okay? So here's the um, image that we've been working with. So you'd think that your most stable emulsion will have the most number of nanoparticles um, on the surface, okay? So we can 
measure the size of the droplets in the emulsion. We do that optically. And we know how many nanoparticles we've put into the emulsion because we know their mass and we know their size. And so with some assumptions, we can calculate um, how many of those nanoparticles would be on the surface of the droplets if they were in closest hexagonal packing, okay? So what we can do is, as a function of nanoparticle concentration, I can tell you what fraction of the total nanoparticles we've put into the, uh, into the emulsion have actually arrived at the oil-water interfaces. And what's interesting is that, especially at high nanoparticle concentrations, fewer than 20% of the nanoparticles are at the, the oil-water interface. Most of them are just hanging out in the aqueous phase. What in the world are they doing? How are these emulsions even stable? Well, it all comes back to interparticle forces. I'm probably going to sound like a broken record here. You guys, I hope you guys take away take this away from this talk. But okay, there's there's a lot going on here. But what I want to point out is that um, we've got this additional steric repulsion here between the particles because of the fact that we put polymer polymers on them. Okay, so um, what I want you to pay attention here is to here is the the black line. That's our our total interaction potential. That's the sum of the three the three uh, mechanisms that we're looking at. So when our particles are dispersed in deionized water, there is a relatively high energy barrier to um, having them be attracted to each other. It's you know on the order of 12 times KT. But when we put these in brine, because brine reduces the strength of the electrostatic repulsion, there's a lower energy barrier. Now it's still an energy barrier, but it's lower. And so these particles can get a little bit closer to each other. And as it turns out, we think that this is there's kind of a Goldilocks spot here, if you will. We've got just the right amount of interaction. So you can think of what these emulsions look like um, in deionized water versus in brine. So in deionized water, um, the particles will attach at the droplet interfaces, obviously, because they're, that's an energetically favorable place for them to be. But there will still be some that are hanging out in the aqueous phase here. And because the repulsion between the particles is so great, they will not want to get close to each other. They'll find their happy separation distance and stay like that. Now, when you change that aqueous phase to a brine, you reduce the repulsion between the particles and they can actually start forming these interdroplet aggregate networks. Um, it's, it's a little bit like a self-assembly phenomenon. And what this does is it prevents the droplets from getting too close to each other. And it actually gives you some very interesting um, viscoelastic properties of these emulsions. Now, we've actually observed this. So these are cryo scanning electron microscope images of emulsions that are stabilized with these glymo-coated silica nanoparticles. So in deionized water, this is an individual emulsion droplet. And if we zoom in here, you can see these little stipples here. These are the individual nanoparticles that are on the, the droplet surface. And for one thing, you can see that they're not anywhere close to closest packing. They definitely are repelling each other on that surface. And so that you know might be why these emulsions tend to be so weak is that there's a lot of fluid-fluid interface still exposed. Now, when we add uh, some calcium chloride to the system here, we get a very different looking emulsion. So you can see the emulsion droplets here, but they've got this hairy structure between them. This is that interdroplet aggregate network. This is actually self-assembled nanoparticles that are forming this web between the droplets. But then what's interesting is that if you put too much polymer on the surface of the nanoparticles, you don't get that interdroplet aggregate network. You just get emulsion droplets with water. This is just frozen water in the cryo SEM. You don't get that to form. So it takes just the right amount of surface coating and just the right type of particle to make this work. Now, if we really understand what we're doing, there's a lot of interesting things you can do it. So we've investigated how this affects the viscoelasticity of our emulsions. So you can change the, um, the storage modulus and the loss modulus. You can change the complex rheology of these things um, just by modifying the surface coating on your nanoparticles. Um, we've even looked at uh, making water in water emulsions um, with a precisely controlled rheology, which would be really cool for chemical encapsulation. 
Um, and we've even looked at the properties during flow. This is in terms of Reynolds number to see how the droplet sizes in the emulsions change um, with different types of nanoparticles flowing through um, channels of different wettability. So there's a lot of different things you can do with this, including you know, encapsulating chemicals in your frac fluid, um, you know, designing these particles either to mobilize or immobilize your injected carbon dioxide or, or hydrogen if you want to store these things in the subsurface, and um, even fine tune the rheology to really reduce the pressure buildup you get in the near well bore region um, during injection. So there's a lot of neat stuff you can do with these nanoparticles if you know what you're doing. OK, so we've come to the end here, and I hope I've left some time for question and answer. It looks like I have. Um, but what I'd like you to take away from here is that obviously there's a lot of applications of nanotechnology in oil and gas. I've really just talked about using individual nanoparticles, but you can think of doing all kinds of interesting things like this with nanocomposites uh, or, or various nanomaterials that I think would be very, very interesting and fruitful. Um, to make nanotechnology work for you, you need to understand what's going on. And only if you understand what's going on can you really fine tune the physical processes that are underlying what you're trying to do. And I just want to you know, hammer home that you know, we found a lot of great work here in CSEE and you know, I think we've made a lot of progress in you know, pushing the envelope in terms of understanding how these nanotechnology applications work. And you know, I'm looking forward to see what the future brings because you know, there's always something interesting around the corner when it comes to nanotechnology, and um, I think it's got a lot of potential um, still for, for oil and gas. OK, so that brings me to the end of my prepared, um, my prepared slides. So I'm going to come back here and I'm going to stop sharing, and we'll check out some, uh, some of the Q&A. How do you manufacture such small particles consistently. Ah, so there's a couple of different ways of doing it, but the way that we do it's it's a process called the the, uh, the Stober method where you actually start with everything you need dissolved. OK, so when you're working with silica, you'll start at a very high pH and then you'll gradually bring the pH down to the point where the silica starts precipitating. And what's nice about silica is that once it starts precipitating, it will form these balls as long as you can control the temperature conditions in your aqueous solution and they'll grow. And you can stop the reaction at any point you want and you'll produce a very nice mono or almost mono disperse um, assemblage of particles. And um, you know, this is well documented um, out there in the literature. You know, the Sto Stober, the paper, I think it's from the 1970s. I, I could be wrong, but um, it's it's fairly straightforward to do. And you know, there are companies out there that do this at, at large scale. Um, so it's uh, it's pretty neat. You just you take sand and you dissolve it, and then you can grow nanoparticles from it. It's it's uh, it's pretty neat. The next question here is. Um, are surface functionalized nanoparticles available to use or to buy for commercial applications? Um, they actually are. You can go, you know, you can go on the internet. I like to go on, you know, Alibaba to see what's what's available. There's a lot of good stuff out there, but you you can buy this. There are manufacturers in the U.S. that will make these for you as well. Um, one thing, this to kind of uh, jump off this question to one thing that that I'd like to point out. Right now. The surface modification, it's its a two pot process, OK? You've got to make the nanoparticles first, then you've got to do the surface the surface coating. What would be really cool is to see uh, somebody devise a one pot manufacturing process where you grow the particles and they've already got the surface coating on it. Um, I have you know feel like I review a lot of nano catalyst papers with these novel one pot procedures and you know I definitely like to see some of that um, help out along the way with our surface coated nanoparticles because um, you know they're they're expensive. I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. They're still a little bit of a boutique product and that type of you know industrial engineering I think would go a long way to um, to helping their their widespread application. Oh, this is a good question. Uh, how do you deal with nanoparticles in the oil or the water after after production? Will it affect refinery operations and do we need to separate out the nanoparticles before sending it for refining? Yeah, so this, you know, th this can be this can be a problem. Now, 
there's a couple of a couple of things I want to point out here. So one is that if you are injecting a nanoparticle stabilized foam into into your rock, the nanoparticles um, will come out preferentially wanting to be in the water. OK, it's if you're you unless you're using a completely hydrophobic nanoparticle, uh, it's very unlikely that the nanoparticles will come out in the oil. They'll they'll mainly be in the water. Um, and, um, you know, there are definitely um, separation techniques that, that you can do for that. Um, so, you know, one thing that we've looked at is actually using um, iron oxide nanoparticles that can be re removed with a magnet. Um, but, you know, certainly if you've got silica nanoparticles coming out, you have to, um, you know, probably figure some figure out some treatment scheme unless you just want to go ahead and recycle the water, which is um, which is which is certainly possible. Um, but you know, certainly they can be concentrated. They can be dissolved. Um, there's a lot of different things, uh, different things you can do with it. Now, another thing I'll point out about the on the refining side is that there actually has been some studies that show that you can amend your oil with carbon black nanoparticles, and it actually makes it easier to refine. And I think the reason for that is the carbon black soaks up a lot of impurities. And so then when it goes through the refinery, it's already kind of refined to begin with. So there's um, some challenges there, but also some potential uh, benefits and opportunities. Are there any extra advantages of silica nanoparticles? I guess, um, you know, cost, ease of preparation, availability. Um, I guess this would be relative to different types of nanoparticles. Yeah, a lot of it has to do with cost and the ease of preparation. Um, like I was saying earlier, you can make silica nanoparticles out of sand. And, um, you know, I don't now we've you know, there's been a lot of news over the past few years about how sand is becoming a little bit of a scarce commodity. But assuming you can find sand, you can very easily make um, silica nanoparticles. That's not this. That's not true for something like, you know, a carbon nanotube. Those things are you know, fairly, fairly expensive to manufacture. So that's the um, that's the most um, you know, beneficial part of using silica. Also, the surface reactions when you graft coatings onto them are very easy to do because um, you know, the, the, the silane surface groups react very readily with a number of different chemicals, and so they're fairly easy to work with. OK, I guess this is part two of that question. Um, are there any guidelines for nanoparticle screening prior to application so we can avoid unwanted results like cement pumpability in the illustrated cement additive work. Yeah, so that's one of the things that we've been working on developing here is screening protocols. Now, most of our screening protocols have been focused on emulsions and foams. Um, and so um, my student, Chris Griffith, uh, who works at Chevron now, um, did some really good work looking at, um, you know, refining this centrifugation um, the centrifugation process and also looking at flow through uh, through capillary tubes to really understand the dynamic and static stability of the um, of, of the of the foams and how to tune the nanoparticles for that. Um, we haven't looked as much at the cement, but this is definitely an area that you know that's one of the first things is probably to be able to develop some protocols for that. Yeah, here's a here's a good question. Can you expand on CO2 CO2 mobilization using nanoparticles? Yeah, OK, so this is a really good question. The um, rheology of nanoparticle stabilized foams depends on the um, well, for one thing, it depends on what the foam, um, you know, what the foam quality is, but also it depends on the wettability of the of the nanoparticles. So, you know, if they sit too far on one side of the interface, um, you can get, uh, you know, very viscous foam or a foam that has a very low viscosity. And one of the things that people have looked at is, you know, tuning these nanoparticles to have either time or pH sensitive properties. And so, you know, you can think of pumping these things down whole and over time the or, or into the formation and over time the um, surface modification will degrade in such a way that changes the rheology of the foam over time. Um, so this, you know, this is an area of active research, but that's, um, you know, one thing that could be done. Yeah, you know, I could also think of doing this for, you know, like seasonal hydrogen storage. That's a, it's an area that we're that we're getting into. Oh, this is a really good question. Um, I'm glad you asked. Is there an application of nanomaterials for demulsification? Yes, we actually have a paper on that. 
OK, so you make a very strong emulsion when it's stabilized with particles and maybe you don't want that emulsion. OK, so you could think of this like in a you know, SAG-D uh, scenario where you're, you're what you're producing is mostly a Pickering emulsion, right? Depending on who you ask. And we've actually shown that you can de-emulsify simply by using uh, nanoparticles of the, of the opposite wettability. So what we did is we formed an oil and water emulsion using hydrophilic silica nanoparticles, and then we exposed them to a hydrophobic fumed silica and it just it just demulsifies like that. So you're using a different type of nanoparticle and it really it gets into those little spots where you've got fluid fluid contacts and you know those hydrophobic particles would rather be in the oil phase and so they cross the interface and the interface falls apart. It's actually really easy to do, um, but um, I'd you know, be, be happy to um, send you that paper if you uh, if you drop me an email. If you reduce the nanoparticle concentration in brine, are the Pickering emulsions still stable or do you need the aggregates to make them stable? No, I mean, you can form emulsions with with very small amounts of nanoparticles. Um, you know, I think what I showed there is you do reach a point where you don't have enough nanoparticles for it to be stable. Um, but one of the things we're looking at and that we'll be presenting at ATCE this, this fall is what the relationship is with actually the size of the nanoparticles. So, you know, can you get away with having fewer nanoparticles if they're slightly larger because the energy, the energy of attachment goes up? So, you know, definitely some things you can try there. OK, so here's kind of a, a semantic question. Nanostructure particles, they're not nano sized. So they count as nanotechnology. Yeah, so you know these nano aggregates. A lot of people talk about using fumed silica nanoparticles, and fumed silica is never individual nanoparticles. It's always aggregated. And um, you know, again, I would say I don't think there's a really strict definition about this, but I would say as long as your aggregates are still smaller than 100 nanometers, then you could call it nano sized. But if you're colloidal sized, then you know, calling them nano is maybe not appropriate. I know some people want to like to throw the word nano in there just to make it sound fancy, but you know, <laughs> sometimes we have to resist the temptation. Can nanoparticles destabilize wax, organic scale, or asphalt fumes? Um, yeah, the short answer is yes. We've done this with our with our our nano paint by just heating them up. This could be done for flow assurance. But um, yeah, there's also some work that uh, looks at either removing those things from your oil or actually um, disaggregating them by um, exposing them to a nanoparticle with a particular chemical attached to the surface. So um, I haven't done a whole lot of work on that, but I am, am aware of, of work out there in the literature. Oh, this is a good question, HSE question. I like those. Is it safe to um, inhale when they're not in solution? No. <laughs> You have to be really careful when you're working with these things as a powder. We always work with them under a fume hood. Um, they're much, much safer in aqueous uh, aqueous dispersion. There have been some studies looking at toxicity. Um, they're definitely less toxic than um, surfactants, um, but there could still be some concerns, so I would definitely not recommend ingesting them. I've got um, probably one more question I want to get to here, and that is in our in our mud cake application study, did we look at unfavorable or favorable drilling rheology? We did not. That was something we looked at in a separate project and the results were kind of inconclusive. So I'd definitely like to go back to the, uh, the rheology aspect there. Thank you all for coming. Um, join us next month for Dr. Okuno's uh, seminar.